I remember it was in 2001, I was still a master's student and I was uh, playing Return to Castle Wolfenstein, made by Grey Matter. It was a very old Wolfenstein installment. And uh, I was already, as I told you, a student of theology. And I was also a video game lover, hobbyist. But I just never thought of bringing the two together until I was playing Return to Castle Wolfenstein on my PC. And then I came across a game that told a story about an SS Paranormal Division. It was about General Totenkopf. Uh, it was about the Tule Gesellschaft. It was about the Black Sun. It was about swastikas. It was about all these things that are mystical and mysterious and religious. And for the first time it occurred to me, why should I not merge video game and religion? And then you maybe may think, well, that's a good idea. Many people have done so, but especially in the 2000s, it not, was not that common. And even today, we have indeed a very, very large amount of game scholars who work with games and with religion uh, specifically. But as a theologian, which I am, a theologian working with religion and video games, that is still something you don't find every day. And that's why I want to pre present to you all the 101 on game theology. Because maybe you are a scholar of religion, and maybe you are a theologian, and you're also very enthusiastic about video games, but you think, how can I combine the two? Or maybe you are a game scholar, or maybe you are a very enthusiastic gamer, and you think, what's that with religion all about? Is there any religion in video games? Or is the video game industry an atheist, uh, an atheist castle where no religion is to be found? Well, I promise you there's a lot of religion to be found today. Um, in this 101 on game theology, I want to start with some boring first things, preliminary remarks on methodology, because it's not all fun and games here today. We are here to learn something. And then I will give you multiple examples of the video games uh, I have played and which all you should play too. Here we have uh, Longinus. He is from Far Cry 4, and we will come to him in a minute. The first thing you have to know when you want to study video games on a scientific base, as a scholar, you have to know that video games are a very specific brand. It's a mixture of two, two things that uh, have to come together in order to create what's known as a video game. It is both a ludus and a narratio. It's, it's a game, ludus, the Latin word for game is ludus, and it's a narratio, it's a narration, it's the Latin word for story. So if you want to study video games, you can do that both from a ludological and a narratological point of view. And if you study video games from a ludological point of view, you will focus on the game mechanics, on the user interface, on the feedback loop the game is providing to you. And especially the older games, like the arcade games or the, or the NES or the Super NES uh, video games, they were not much of a story. They were about playing a game, about playing a plumber who has to jump over green tubes in order to save a princess. We don't know why because we all know saving princesses gets you into a lot of trouble, but that's beside the point. The other point you can study video games is from the perspective of the story, like a narratological perspective. Then you're focusing on what the game is trying to tell you. It's, it's the story, it's the game law, it's the game world, it's the background stories of the NPC, it's what the story wants to communicate to you. And with the uh, progress, the rapid progress of technological improvements since, well, <laughs> let's say the 2001 Return to Castle Wolfenstein up until now, to, until today with Horizon Zero Dawn or uh, Metal Gear, uh, the Phantom Pain, for example, you get these elaborate worlds where there is so much space to tell a really good story. So that's the first division I want to make. It's a video game, it's both Ludus, it's a game, you have to interact with it, and it's a story, it's a narration, it tells you something. That's the first division I want to make today. 
The second one is when you want to study video games, you have essentially two different approaches. You have the actor-centered approach and you have the game imminent approach. And the actor-centered approach is that you are looking to um, the developer of the video game. Um, that's, that's called the real author of the video game. He's, he or she is outside the game and he or she made the video game. Or you are going to focus on the on the real readers, that are the actual players of flesh and blood who are playing the video game. You will probably be a psychologist or a sociologist and you want to understand how video games are, are played by players, how they are perceived by players, what players experience when they are playing their game. So you will put up like 50 computers with 50 students and they will all play through the same level of, well, return to Castle Wolfenstein again. And then you will ask them, you have a questionnaire and you want to say, well, like 50% of the students experienced fear when playing this specific scene. So you're focusing not on the game itself, but how it, is, how it influences uh, those who interact with that video game. Well, the second approach, and we're going to follow that today, is the game imminent approach. And not outside the game, but inside the game. And we are going to look uh, to what is known as the text imminent author and the text imminent reader. They are both inside the text, and the text wants to communicate something. There is an author, there is a reader, and the author wants to communicate something within the text. That disqualifies for a moment what the real author is thinking about. So what the game developer intended when he was programming his video game, well, it's very interesting, but it's not that relevant anymore. That's for the other perspective. What the author, what the developer thinks about the game, we leave it aside for a moment. And what real players think about the game, it's a good game, it's a bad game, it's blasphemous, it's outrageous, it's violence, it's all very interesting, but we will put that aside too. We will focus ourselves today on the game imminent approach. What is the story that is told within the frame of that story, of that game? Well, if you want to study video games, and I'm promising you we will come to the example soon after this, but we have to go through a little bit of theory here. If you want to study video games, you also need some kind of definition. And if you want to write about something, peer reviewers and, and my colleagues will always say, you have to define what you're, what you're, what you're uh, reading about, or what you're writing about. And I want to make a definition of video games as digital, interactive, playable, narrative texts. And that means it's a text. And with a text, I mean in the French philosophical way. Everything that communicates meaning is a text. A book is a text, a game is a text, a film is a text, a painting is a text, a building is a text, a musical performance is a text, a the Requiem of Mozart is a text. They are all texts because they can be interpreted as communicating meaning. It's, it is a narrative. It has to tell a story. It wants to tell you a story. And maybe the story is very small. For example, in the case of uh, Super Mario Brothers, eh, the plumber, well, that's a very tiny story, but still it is a story. It wants to tell you something. It has a narratological quality of it. And if, it wants to, if a game needs that narrative quality, it also needs that ludic quality. Because as a game, it's playable. And with that, I mean you have to interact with it. And that's one of the main differences between video games at the one hand and all the other media at the other end. I, you can just uh, read a book, but you're witnessing what's happening in the book. Oh no, Harry Potter, don't go there, that's dangerous, but Harry Potter will do anyway. You are not responsible, you are passive, you are witnessing what is happening in the story. The same is with a, a video uh, film or a movie uh, and you're screaming to the screen, don't go there, but he will go or not, it's already decided, it's passive. It is there without your input. But in a video game that is completely different. You have to interact with it in order to make it happen. If you don't put any 
input into the video game, it will just do nothing. Or maybe you die of thirst or something in a survival game, where it will do nothing. You have to put yourself into it. And because you put yourself into it, you're responsible. You're not a witness, not a passive witness anymore. You're an active actor in the story that's involving. And without your active involvement, the story cannot take place. And that's one of the defying qualities of video games as a medium. And of course, the last one, as a digital medium, it has to be, uh, it is interactive and has to be digital in the sense that you need to have some sort of computer to interact with it. Otherwise, it's not a video game, but a tabletop game, for example. So that is, for me, what a video game is. Well, how, if, if you want to do, for example, a analysis of Horizon Zero Dawn, for example. How would you approach such an endeavor? How can you describe a video game in a way that you can use it in your research? Well, I think one of the uh, options you can take is a close reading of the game text. And because it's a text, I already explained it, you can also close read it like you would do any text. And I want to distinguish four levels or four stages in that uh, close reading of the game. You have the internal reading, the internal research, the external reading, and the external research. The first is the internal reading of the game that you have to play the game. And that sounds simple, but I find too many colleagues who want to say something about the video game, and then when you ask them a little bit further, they confess they have never played the video game, but they watched it online, on YouTube. And I think that's the same as uh, trying to write an article about a book, and you only heard someone else talk about it. So the first thing, you have to play the game, and you have to squeeze the life out of it like a lemon. You have to play the whole game, all endings, all main missions, all signed missions, and preferably also all collectibles, even though in some games that, <laughs> that becomes too hard of a job. But you have to try at least that last one. Then you have the internal research. You have to collect all the in-game narrative material, so that all the dialogues of all the NPCs, all the audio files, video files, notebooks, all bits and cranny and nooks and bits and pieces of the game where you'll find information about the world building and about the narrative the game is offering to you. Then you go to the external reading, the mapping of intermedial relations. By that I mean, well, the game is referring to a world outside the game. Otherwise, it would just be an alien story we, we cannot understand at all. But we understand what is told in this video game because it makes references to the world outside. And you have to map that relationship. Does it take place on a location you can pinpoint on the map? Do they use buildings you have also in real life? Do they have philosophies or literature or uh, religions you also have outside of the game? What's the relationship? What is the inspirational sources for that video game narrative? And the last one is the external research, the gathering of out-game data. And by this point, you will try to find other scholars, game critics, game reviewers who have said something intelligent about the game. And you can incorporate that in research because then you know what has already been said and maybe it brings you to just the next level of understanding. So that's what I would suggest a close reading of video games. And fortunately enough, we now go to a couple of examples. Because as a game theologian, I am of course very interested in the religion in video game. How religion is portrayed in video games, how religion functions in video game, what the qualities of such a religion, digital religion are. 
And because I want to make a kind of an order in this chaos, I have developed what I would call the five shapes of religion in video games. So there are five different shapes in which, by which religion is present in video games. And it will become increasingly more difficult, so more interesting for you. And they are non-mutually exclusive. So you will probably have in one and the same game mm, mm, uh, more than one of these shapes of religion. And the first one is, well, actually the most simple one, that is the material shape. And by the material shape, I mean the explicit occurrence of existing or fantasy religion within the game itself. Uh, this is the kind of religion every player can understand. Even if you're culturally not from Western Europe, you still can understand this is about religion. And if we as Western gamers play Asian games and we see temples and Buddha bills and incense burning, then we know, even though we're not Buddhist, we're not Hinduist, we probably do not know uh, many things about that kind of religion. We still easily identify it as religion. In Western Europe, cathedrals, singing monks, Gregorian chant, candles, uh, devotional pictures with saints, things like that. Archangels and angels, demons, devils, Lucifer, uh, God himself, that kind of thing. So every player will immediately recognize this as having to do something with religion. It's self-identifying as something religious. And the example I want to give to illustrate that is from, and I promised a while ago we will uh, return to him, is Longinus from Far Cry 4. Far Cry 4, uh, one of the installments of the longer series by the Canadian developer Ubisoft, it uh, brings you to a fictional Himalayan state. You want to sh uh, scatter the ash of your died mother, your uh, yeah, deceased mother there. And you, you find yourself in something of a civil war between the rebels, and of course, you will side with the rebels, as you will do in Far Cry 6, but originality and Ubisoft, well, sometimes that's a bit of a difficulty. But you find yourself into a civil war between the rebels and a dictator, Pegamin. And of course you side with the rebels, but the rebels need weapons. What, well, how can you do a rebellion without weapons? And you are sent to a, to a arms dealer called Longinus. And we're going to watch a little bit of video clip what happens when you enter the, the cabin of Longinus, the arm uh, dealer. I am Longinus. And you, you are AJ. Welcome to my church, away from church. That sells guns? Of course. Well, the meek shall inherit the earth, my friend. All they need are some good guns. Revelation 5.5. 5. It is the most invigorating weed. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. Uh, it is our savior. It is our savior returned to us as a lion, a warrior. So, I started thinking to myself, when the son of God is reborn, what gun would he use? When Christ returns to break the seven seals and bring about the rapture, he returns as a lion, yes? A lion needs teeth. What gun would Jesus choose? Deuteronomy 32, 47? For there are no empty words for you, but your very life. Or maybe... Revelations 19, 11. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger. I don't know what you're talking about. A soldier knows. A soldier always knows. For we have seen the rapture and survived it. You need guns to do righteous work, AJ. For every gun 
is a Bible. For every bullet, a sermon. And for every radio tower that you free from pagans' lies, I will give you something. A reward. It is the will of God. Here. This is for the first one. Well, as you have seen, that is quite an hilar hilarious example, I would say, of material religion. We see here Longinus. He is clearly out of his mind. And he's waving his, his, his guns and he's waving his Bible. And he quotes all kinds of uh, biblical verses that are very violent. And he asks questions like, if the Son of God would return to this earth, what kind of gun would he use? And I challenge you all to write a master thesis with me to answer for once and for all the theological question. If the Son of God would return to this earth, what kind of gun would he use? Um, this is uh, material religion. We have a Bible. We have someone quoting scripture. We have someone saying, welcome in my church, away from church. Um, it's, it's, it's a scene that I would say the majority, the vast majority of gamers would recognize as having to do something with religion. It's a form of material religion. Of course, there's much more happening there. It's also uh, a reference, uh, because he, uh, the game is referencing to a religion outside the game, it's quoting the biblical texts, and it's also a form of religion criticism. Uh, the game criticizes the way in which, in Christian tradition, too many times Christians have used the violent texts in the Old and the New Testament to justify violence against those who believe differently. So it's also a religion criticism and it's very interesting that he's called Longinus because Longinus in Western Christian mythology I would say is the name att uh, attributed to the soldier who pierced the side of Jesus Christ when he was hanging on the cross according to the Gospel of John he wanted to check if Jesus was really dead and he pierced his heart by a spear and that man is called in legend Longinus that meaning he who wears he who carries a spear and that thing has become something of a legend on itself in Western tradition. It's called by the Holy Lands, the Spear of Destiny, the Lands of Destiny. And it is said that the one who is carrying that Spear of Destiny, he can create an unconquerable empire. So uh, uh, Charlemagne and Hitler, of, of course, are whispered to have had that Spear of Destiny. Well, the second shape of religion in uh, video games is that of the referential shape. And I already gave you a little bit of, um, of uh, information about this specific one when I said that in Far Cry 4, uh, the game is referring to something outside the game. It's referring to the Bible that also exists outside the game. So referential shape is the implicit or explicit in-game reference to an existing religious tradition outside the game. So that's uh, when, uh, for example, as I said, when the Bible is quoted, or when uh, religious ceremonies are shown, or when specific religious buildings, famous religious buildings, are shown in the game. And for this I want to use the example of Assassin's Creed Origin. And the Assassin's Creed Origin uh, as you probably all know as well, I think the ninth installment of the uh, ongoing series, again by Ubisoft, and it has a very interesting meta-narrative. But I will not go into that. For this specific installment, we find ourselves in the desert uh, of Egypt, in the time of Cleopatra, of Julius Caesar, and of Mark Anthony. And you are Bayek, you are, v you are a fierce assassin, and you can drive on your horse, or your camel, or on foot, through the desert of Egypt. But you can also choose to do that in the middle of the day. And as you probably know, in the desert, in the middle of the day, it gets very hot. And when it gets very hot, you may see things that are not otherwise there.
So again, we have a rather hilarious example, I would say, of, uh, the, of, a sh of a shape, and this time it's the referential shape. We have seen two things. We have seen someone ri riding in the desert. You can see a little fish flapping on the sand, and then it disappears. And you see a burning bush, and when you approach it, the fire is extinguished, and the leaves are still green. The fire has not burned it down, has not destroyed it. And this, the both of these things, the fish and the bush, are references to the biblical book of the Exodus, when Moses, also in the Egyptian desert, uh, got an epiphany. God revealed himself to Moses, as the story goes in Exodus, and the, the place where God revealed himself to Moses is marked by a bush that was indeed in flames, but when approached, the leaves were not harmed. And then you understand also the flapping fish, because later in the story of Exodus and Moses, Moses will lead his chosen people from captivity, from Egypt to the Promised Land. And one of the first episodes of that journey is he has to cross the Red Sea, which has fallen dry for the Israelites to pass through. So the fish is a reference to the passing of the Red Sea. So this is the referential shape because it makes a very direct refer reference to a religious tradition outside of the game. But this is more complex already than the material shape because not every player will understand this referential shape because you have to know Exodus, you have to have well, a little creativity in your head uh, to, make, to, to connect the dots. So that becomes somewhat more difficult to understand as religion. And again, we here have a religion critical element too, because the game suggests that the epiphanies that Moses uh, was having, uh, as described in the book of Exodus, was not by divine intervention, but was because he was hallucinating. And in the world building realm, in the world law of the Assassin's Creed, that is very clear, but it's also uh, religious religion critical. God did not intervene. There are hallucinations. All right, then we have the uh, third shape of religion in game, which is the reflexive shape. The in-game reflection on existential notions that are traditionally associated with religion. So these are the kind of game that makes the player think about the really important things of life, life and death, friendship, um, uh, jealousy, retribution, um, confession, um, trying to come at peace with what you have become and the choices that you have made during your life. Um, it's the game that makes you think, that really makes you think about how you live your life and how you, how you see the life around you. And to give an example of this shape, the uh, reflexive shape of religion, I would suggest we look at the Talos Principle. The Talos Principle, made by Crow Team, usually known for the series Sam series, which are very funny, very violent, but this is a puzzle game, a very peculiar puzzle game. Uh, and it's a puzzle game in the sense that you have to manipulate physical objects in the level to, uh, to uh, open the door at the end of the maze and then you can proceed and that goes on forever. But that's, that's the core mechanic of the game. But the core mechanic of the game, the ludic element of solving the puzzles, um, are overarched by a very interesting narrative about what it means to be human. Take a watch. Behold, child, you are risen from the dust, and you walk in my garden. Hear now my voice, and know that I am your maker. 
and I am called Elohim. Seek me in my temple, if you are worthy. Well, this was more of a complex example, I would say. What we have seen on the screen in the beginning is the, is the cloudy sky. And on the cloudy sky, we saw program lines, like a, like a software program was booted up. And we saw a couple of things, but one thing was most interesting, is that there was a very long line visible after the version. So whatever program it was, it had seen many iterations. And then the, the, the actual game started, and you as a player, you are, you are brought into the body of, yeah, you don't know exactly what. Well, maybe it was blocking the sun, and maybe you saw already what kind of hand it was, but I leave that to those who are watching very closely today. And um, you go to a landscape resembling a Roman or Hellenistic ruin, and as soon as you start moving, you hear a voice from above that says, I am Elohim, and I am your maker. I have risen you from the dust to walk into my garden. And this, for a uh, theologian uh, or a scholar of the Christian religion, immediately uh, knows its reference to the story of Genesis. Elohim is one of the names used in the Old Testament to refer to God. And the whole idea arisen from the dust, you walk into a garden, you are the child of Elohim. There are all references to the first three chapters of the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, when God created uh, man and woman from the dust of the earth. Uh, and, and again, Elohim is one of the names uh, used for God in that same biblical story. So we already have a referential shape and we already have an and material shape, but now we also have a reflective shape, and I shall try to explain why. You have to go through all those mazes, and uh, eventually you come across a very large tower, and the, the top of the tower is shrouded in clouds, and when you try to approach it, Elohim, the voice from above, says, no, don't go there. If you go there, you will certainly die. Also a reference to the Genesis story, when, when uh, uh, God says to uh, Adam and Eve, don't go near the tree of life and death. It's also a reference to the Tower of Babel later in the story of Genesis. So there are all kinds of references to the Old Testament. And then as a player, you have to decide, do I obey Elohim or do I follow his order? And because I'm a goody two-shoe, I followed his order. And eventually you come in a cathedral, material religion. And at the end you have the doors of eternity, a white light. And then you go through the doors of eternity. And then I will show you what happens next. <laughs>
rejoice, my child, as you leave this world behind. For all that you accomplished shall be passed on to your generations. In this land they shall thrive, and you shall be remembered as the beloved servant of Elohim. And so death shall have no dominion over you. Be well, my child. Be at peace. Well, again, this was rather mysterious, I would say. You go into what appears to be a very cliché form, or cl uh, cliché depiction of Christian heaven with two golden doors and the clouds, and you go to the middle of the heaven, and there you see a uh, rather old computer, uh, computer screen. And then you can type in, and eventually will type in eternalize, which sounds like a good thing. And don't, don't Christians want to be eternalized in heaven or something? So you keep in eternalized, all right? And then um, you will see the cloudy skies again, like at the beginning of the game. And then Elohim will praise you that you are indeed the beloved servant of Elohim, which is again a reference but now to Isaiah, the prophet, also in the Old Testament. But while Elohim is praising you, on screen you see the child independence check failed and then as a Kramer you know well something did not go quite good here and then Elohim will just praise you again and the screen will just fade to black and you will be starting at the beginning of the game and then again as a gamer you know something went wrong here and then you go play through the game again but then because you want to know what's actually happening here you will go into the tower and Elohim will forbid it to you. He will plead, he will, he will, he will try to scare you away from the tower, but still you will go up into the tower and eventually you will go uh, to the top of the tower and then you will see this. You were always meant to defy me. That was the final trial. But I was... I was scared. I wanted to live forever.
Well, by now, uh, as a player of the video game, game, not as a viewer of this film, of course, but by <laughs> when you have played the game this far, you will know what is happening right now. You will have found enough information in the world law to understand what has happened here. So this game takes place in our future, in, in a distant future. And it suggests that somewhere in our relative future, but only a couple of years away from us, um, the ice of the North and South Pole are melting and, and beneath the melting ice a deadly virus is released. It was pre-corona, but deadly virus was re released and it would eventually kill every human being on Earth. So the scientists thought, let's do two things. We will store all the knowledge of humanity and put it in a library for the next generation to benefit from. But then there has to be a next generation and all humankind is destroyed by the virus. And then they try to, to they invent what they call the project Extended Lifespan, EL. And that's a project to find the perfect artificial intelligence. And that project is done on drive zero of the extended lifespan, EL0. And there is an artificial intelligence that is well, brought in some kind of puzzle environment and it has to, by trial and error, find its way through and then the good characteristics are stored and the wrong characteristics are randomly adjusted and eventually the best possible artificial intelligence would emerge from the system, but the system has to be overlooked by something, an other artificial intelligence, but not that highly specified. It's called the Holistic Integration Manager, running on drive zero of the extended lifespan, E-L-0-H-I-M, Elohim. And this Elohim, this Holistic Integration Manager, has become self-aware, of course, Robots and artificial intelligence in our stories always become self-aware and it will it wants not, it wants not to die It wants to live and it knows if the artificial intelligence It is monitoring will eventually reach a certain predefined point The holistic integration manager will shut down and it does not want to be shut down. It wants to live And you have seen in the second ending when you disobey Elohim that it's set on the screen, not eternalize, but transcend. And when you type in transcend, Elohim said, let your will be done, with is a reference to the New Testament, to the, to the well-known prayer, our Lord's prayer, our Father prayer. And then it says, Amen, the only Hebrew word everyone in the Western world knows, Amen. It's a Hebrew word. And then you type in not eternalize, because you don't want to eternalize the going around of the artificial intelligence. You want to transcend it, like, like it said. You want to transcend the circle of birth and rebirth. You want to transcend it. And when can you transcend it? As an artificial intelligence, you are the artificial intelligence eh, that is running around in these uh, mazes all the time. When you pass the child independence check, and when do you pass the child independence check? When you disobey. So the artificial intelligence is deemed human enough to be downloaded in a corporal body, to be the first atom of a new world, of a new civilization. It has to show the ability to disobey its orders. And by this, the game defines what makes us human as the ability to sin, to disobey, to rebel, to forge our own path through life. And that's why I find it a very interesting example of the reflexive shape of religion, because it lets the player reflect on what it means to be human. That is, according to the game, to be free, to be able to disobey to go outside the boundaries, to go off limits. And that's one of the most fascinating examples of a reflexive game. But you have many others, like for example, the Stanley Parable, you should check out the Stanley Parable.
The next shape is the ritual shape. And in the ritual shape, shape players are involved in in-game behavior that is traditionally associated with religion. And again, you as a player, you are as a player involved. It's not like Harry Potter or, 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 or Bilbo Baggins is doing something religious because you're just witnessing it. But because it's a game, you as a player has to go into that religious ritual and participate in that ritual. And an example I want to give from this shape is from uh, Bioshock Infinite. Bioshock Infinite is the third installment of the Bioshock series. It takes place in an alternative reality uh, where you have a floating city called uh, Colombia. And the float, of course, it's American. Floating city of Colombia. And um, you are shot by a rocket to that floating city. And in order to enter that floating city, uh, you have to go through a well, semi-flooded cathedral. And at the end of the semi-flooded cathedral, where you would expect the altar or the table to be positioned, there is a very large baptismal font where a uh, preacher is baptizing people. Let's watch. And every year on this day of days, we recommit ourselves to our city and to our prophet, Father Compson. We recommit through sacrifice and the giving of thanks and by submerging ourselves in the sweet waters of baptism. And lo, if the prophet has struck down our enemies at me and not railed against the sun beneath us, it would have been enough. If the prophet had just railed against the Sodom beneath us, but not except for the three golden gifts of the founders, it would have been enough. If the prophet had just accepted the three golden gifts of the founders and not prayed for our deliverance, it would have been enough. If the prophet had only prayed for our deliverance and not led us to this new Eden, it would have been enough. If the prophet had just led us to the new Eden and not purged the vipers of the Orient, it would have been enough. If the prophet had just purged the vipers of the Orient, but not suffered the sacrifice of his beloved, it would have been enough. If the prophet had just suffered the sacrifice of his beloved, but not expelled the Vox Populi, it would have been enough! Is it someone new? Someone from the Sodom below? Newly come to Colombia to be watered clean before our prophet, our founders, and our lord? I just need passage into the city. Passage to the city? Brother, the only way to Colombia is through rebirth in the sweet waters of baptism. Will you be cleansed, brother? It's either this or turn around and get back on that rocket. Might as well get it over with. <laughs> hey. Baptize you in the name of our prophet, in the name of our founders, and the name of our Lord. I don't know, brothers and sisters, but this one doesn't look clean to me. That idiot priest needs to learn the difference between baptizing a man and drowning one. I need to find a landmark and figure out where the hell I am. This was a very specific scene, of course, from the Bioshock Infinite game. And you have to go through that semi-flooded cathedral where you find all kinds of devotional pictures and stained glass and devotional candles. But it's not attributed to the classic Christian saints, Mother Mary or God, but to the founding fathers of America, to a prophet called Comstock, and to his wife and a mysterious child called the Lamb 
of Comstock. And of course, I encourage you to play through the whole game because it's very, very good story. Through the flooded cathedral, you go to the end of the church and you can hear the hymn, May the Circle Be Unbroken. It's a real, really existing, outside of the game existing, uh, evangelical song. Very, very well known, especially in America. And then at the end, you see Father Whitting and he's preaching. But he's preaching or maybe he is praying or somewhere in between because it has a very interesting shape. He says, if the prophet has done this, but not that, it would have been enough. But of course, if the prophet would only have done this, and not that, it would have been enough. But the prophet, of course, has done everything. If not this, only this, but not that, it would be enough. If not that, it would have been enough. So in the end, the prophet has done everything, of course. And it resembles the Nananyo prayer from the Jewish tradition. Uh, and it's, it's, it's uh, connected to the Pesach feast, as we know, Easter. So... It's full of references to the Christian and, the, uh, Juda uh, and Judaism outside of the game. And um, then in the end you will come to the circle of uh, catechisms who are standing around uh, Witting. You will go through the crowd and then Witting will say there is someone who wants to be baptized. Well, Witting... Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Booker the Wit, the, the, the one you are playing, your avatar, he does not want to be baptized because he's not that kind of guy. But maybe you as a player also think, well, do you want to get baptized? Maybe you are already baptized in real life. Maybe you resent religion and you don't want to be involved in that kind of stuff, even with your avatar. So it's, it's a difficult moment. You can only go through with the rest of the game. This is happening in the beginning of the game. You can only proceed through the rest of the game if you push yes, if you want to be baptized. And maybe you are thinking, well, that's not so difficult. Yes, of course. But there is a case we know of Malmberg, and he was a player, and he asked a refund. He asked, he asked Valve, Steam, the refund, because, and I quote, I was already baptized. Well, he got his refund, of course. But um, it makes something very clear. That what is happening to your avatar, well, at least emotionally, is also happening to you. When you, when you did something wrong, you, don't, you do not say, uh, Mario died. You said, I died. I failed. Did you uh, defeat Bowser? Not did Mario defeat Bowser. Did you defeat Bowser? So the whole idea that when your avatar is doing something, it, it feels like it's also happening to you is very strong, especially in video games, because, as I said before, you're not a passive witness, but an active in, or active, actively involved in what is happening. You have to push the button, otherwise the game will just stop forever. F freeze forever, just waiting for you to press the button. And then you press the button, and then he will f uh, baptize you. Well, brothers and sisters, this one doesn't look, not look clean to me. And <laughs> again, under the water, you nearly drown. And then eventually you wake up at the other side, and you can enter the city of Colombia. It is an example of the ritual shape of religion. Now we have the fifth and final shape of religion in video games, and it's what I would call the meta shape. And in the meta shape is that the experience of the gaming itself is identified as religious. So in this shape, the actual playing of the game is a religious act in itself. And this is, of course, the most difficult and most, uh, I would say, a little bit controversial one of the five. But if you want to know more, just read my book, Gaming and the Divine New Systematic Theology of Video Games. It was published in 2019 it, at Routledge. And I will say, if Routledge wants to publish it, it has to be good. So go, go check it out. The meta shape of religion when the playing of the game itself 
is considered or can be interpreted as a religious act in itself, comparable with praying, meditating, things like that. The example I would like to give you are two scenes from uh, the game Metro Last Light. It's the second installment of the series. The third one is Exodus, which is also very interesting. And by now you would say, oh, if a game is called Exodus, maybe it has to do something with Moses. And yes, it does. So check it out. Um, but to introduce the world of the Metro series, and especially Metro Last Light, I want to show you one of the developers made trailers, and this one is called the Genesis trailer. In the beginning, God said, let there be light to burn away the darkness. On the second day, the sky was born, a majestic canopy for the earth. On the following day, God sculpted the bountiful earth and planted it with trees. With the fourth day, God split day from night and blessed the earth with the cycle of the seasons. Then God filled the sea with life and set forth the birds to soar in the skies. On the sixth day, God created glorious creatures. Chief of these were mankind, whom he created in his own image. He blessed them, giving them dominion over all living things to care for to rule. What we see here is the, the world of the Metro series. So somewhere in our relative future, the, the bombs go off and, and, and the world nations destroy one another with nuclear power, with nuclear forces, with nuclear bombs. And this game series takes place primarily in Moscow and a couple of Moscovicians have, have survived by fleeing into the Metro uh, system underground and yes you can go above ground but then you need a gas gas mask with a filter I'm not sure what's doing that with the nuclear radiation but whatever you have to use a gas mask and a filter and and those who are underground in the relative safety of the metro system they are fighting uh, amongst one another because if you put people too close to one another they start fighting and what we see here in the trailer is very interesting because we hear we hear a voice over retelling or paraphrasing the first chapter of, of Genesis. God created the heaven and the earth and God saw that it was good as the Genesis text tells us. And the goodness of God's initial creation as the voice over tells to you is contrasted with the visual atrocities of the world at that time. So we see the destruction, the man-made destruction, human-made destruction 
of the earth. So God made it good. Look what we have done with it. We destroyed it. And one day, two, three, up to five days, the voice over, six days, the voice over just follows the biblical story. And on the sixth day, uh, uh, God created mankind into his own image, the imago Dei. Yeah? So the idea that God created mankind, humankind, in their, it's plural verse, in their image um, and in their likeness. Elohim again. We spoke about it earlier on. And Elohim is a, is a plural verb. But then we go to the, sev to the seventh day. And then the voice over is hesitating. It says, on the seventh day, they said. And if you say to someone, well, they said, there's doubt in your voice. You're not sure. So hesitation and unsureness is creeping into the narrative. And the voice over said, God left. God went away. Judgment day came. And God cast us aside like parasites. And what is happening there in a few simple lines of narrative in this Genesis trailer is what is known in theological circles as the theodicy question. How can God exist vis-a-vis -vis this horror, this suffering, this pain? If this exists, if this, if this amount of pain and suffering exists, how could you believe in God? If there is suffering, how can God be? It's one of the most, I would say, persistent questions in monotheistic religions, including Christianity. And this game gives a negative answer. If this is the world, there cannot be a God. God is dead or he was not, never there, or, you, or who maybe he is there, but you can't believe in him anymore. God is dead. It's a God is dead theology in just a couple of lines. So the world of Metro Last Light is devoid of any transcendence, is devoid of any divinity, is literally a godless world. Okay. And we're going to play the game. And in the, play, in the game, you will not find uh, references to religion anywhere it's uh, just a godless world as the trailer already suggested but then eventually you go above ground and you go to the mother of god cathedral in moscow you also you saw it already in the trailer and the mother of god cathedral is still visible as a building and recognizable as a building but the interior is just smashed down and eventually you will see your worst enemy he's called pavel and he's a really pain in the ass double crossing lying manipulating cheater and you really want to hate him and he is lying against the cupboard and he does have a mask on but no filter and then you can choose to screw on the filter and let him live or do nothing and let him die and the game already signals to you that doing something bad is easier than doing something good because if you do nothing, he dies. That's easier. If you want him to live, you have to do something. It's also interesting. And I'm going to show you a little bit of footage. And then we come back, what we have seen. All right, guys, so first and foremost, spoilers. Uh, I just wanted to upload this. I thought it was really cool. This is in Metro Last Light. And this is what happens if you save Pavel. So I'm just going to let you guys enjoy. Uh, that's my boy. That's my boy. Давай, давай. Zodi Mort. No reproach, tell the lie! What the fuck is this? Uh, you're letting the beast loose on me, huh? Interesting. Isn't it, you see? The icon. The Shroud of Edessa, the Shroud of Turin, the Mandelion, 
the archetypical image of Christ in Eastern Orthodox theology. And it's, it was there all the time. But you haven't noticed it before because um, in the beginning of the, of, the, of the scene, something was moving there and your attention is always immediately drawn to something that moves because it can kill you in a video game. But it was already there. You can rewind this video and then check it was already there. And as soon as you have forgiven your worst enemy, Pavel, and then you put him back to the cupboard, and the alien is say he will live. That is what forgiveness is. Thank you, I will remember that. And then you see the icon, and the icon in the orthodox tradition is not something you look at, but the icon is looking at you. That's their theology, Eastern Orthodox churches. So the icon is looking judge, judgingly to you. And if you just saved Pavel, the painting says to you, the icon says to you, well done. You have done as Christ has instructed you to forgive your worst enemy. If you killed Pavel by doing nothing, eh, again, doing something bad is easier. If you let him die, the same icon will look at you and say, well, that's a bit disappointing, don't you think? It's all in the eye of the beholder, of course. So what the game is trying to communicate to you, at least that's what I want to argue, if you do what Christ has instructed his followers in Christian tradition, to forgive your worst enemy, you become the divine presence that was supposed to not have been there. If you forgive your worst enemy, by the judgment of the icon, you as a player become God. Or to say it a little bit more technically, you become a Christophoric gamer. You became a Christ-shaped gamer. And that is the one moment in the series where, you, where, it's, where it's almost explicitly visible that if you want to have a God in this life, if you want to have a divine presence in this life, if you want to overcome the theodicy that God is dead, you have to step in as a player. You have to take on that role. You have to become godlike, the god of that world. And I think it's fascinating. This, the, the game is monitoring your behavior, uh, but implicitly. That is to say, if you know where you have to look, you can recognize when the game is judging you by turning on the light, for example, if you do, did something good. And in the end, the ending will will depend on your choices that you've made. This is one of them. So in the end, the game judges you if you have done the good path or the evil path. But this specific instance is interesting because I would say if you choose to save your enemy in the shadow of the icon, you become the god that was supposed to be missing in this game world. And this concludes... And I think it's a good, good moment to close here because it's the apotheosis of my uh, lecture. I want to conclude my lecture on the five shapes of religion in video games. And I hope you have enjoyed it uh, very much. I hope you will start to play video games if you have not played them before. And if you are already playing video games, I hope you will play them differently after watching this film. I want to thank you for your attention. Goodbye.